Sydney Harbour, the centrepiece of Australia's premier international city. Its glimmering body of water is a focal point for both locals and visitors. You cannot imagine any place that's got such a beautiful harbour, uh, such incredible beaches, uh, some of the most beautiful landscapes you can imagine in the world right next to the city. Sydney is just, no wonder, one of the most livable cities in the world. The flow of cargo in and out from the Western Harbour wharves provided the economic lifeblood of the city and the nation for over 150 years. But after the turn of the 21st century, changing technology and economic demands saw the working harbour moved out of the city, presenting a unique opportunity for a reimagining of the area. I felt there was a once in two century opportunity to take the former industrial maritime, industrial lands and link them up into, again, a recognisable group of headlands. The opportunity to turn this back into a living, vibrant, dynamic part of the city was something that couldn't be missed. There's nothing quite like it that's been done in Australia previously. I mean, some of the international experts who've come here do say this is, you know, the number one urban renewal opportunity internationally. Almost a world first and a world only opportunity and it is something you really want to take advantage of. This is the story of one of the most ambitious urban renewal projects in Australian history, transforming a 22 hectare former container port into a vital new dimension of this global city. Whenever you're trying to do something major in a city, it's controversial. It is a very unique site that provides a once in a generation opportunity for the city, and it is one of those where politics should be put aside. If you're doing something as big and bold and strong as what we're doing here, if you didn't upset some people, we would have failed. A site like this, its development, you get one shot, you've got 200 year life minimum, you need to get it right. Rich in history, the harbour has been home to the indigenous people of Sydney for many thousands of years. Located on the traditional lands of the Gadigal people, the Barangaroo Precinct is named after a powerful Aboriginal woman. She was a, a fisherwoman, but she was also an elder by the time that she, uh, she married Ben Long. And she was very highly regarded and highly respected by the people, so they would look up to her. Before European settlement, a great body of Aboriginal people here lived in the more intimate part of the harbour, where the headlands were closer. Barangaroo and Benelong owned Goat Island. Aboriginal people would canoe between the islands because it was only half a kilometre to Ballast Point, to Balmain, to McMahon's Point, to Ball's Head and to Barangaroo. I think Captain Arthur Phillip might have thought that she was going to be a bit of a pushover, but there was no way in the world that uh, Barangaroo was going to be a pushover for anybody. There is a story where Ben Long was invited to go to Parliament House, and while Ben Long was the dandy, if you like, and dressed up in the English fineries, uh, she just uh, refused to wear clothes and, and she went along. She wanted to continue uh, her culture, Aboriginal Gadigal culture. She wasn't going to be swayed to take on the new European culture at all. As the landing point for the first European settlers, Sydney became a working port and hub of industry and the centre of the national economy. Originally, this area became poorly built commercial wards from the 1830s onwards. The plague came in 1890 and the government resumed all the land and bought all the wharves. All the wharves which faced Darling Harbour were knocked over by the Maritime Services Board in between 1958 and 1962. And the reclamation, filling in Cockle Bay and cutting the headland in half, was the biggest reclamation in Australian history. With the waterfront stretching 1.4 kilometres along the harbour foreshore, right on the western fringe of the Sydney CBD, the site represented an historic opportunity for transformation.
the Premier of the State at the time, Bob Carr, made a decision that the stevedoring operations here was ending its lease period and was moving to Botany and it was time really to look at the reuse of this site. The first step was to at least alert the government and the Cabinet that there was a better idea than simply handing it over to some foreshore authority to sell the land. Maybe the city deserved something better. So I approached Premier Bob Carr about 2004. The Cabinet had, and the bureaucracy had no idea really what the scheme would be or how it would unfold, but simply that the Cabinet had agreed that half of it would be open space. 50% for urban development that was part of the city, 50% for open space, public spaces, green areas, parklands. What the government did is announce that they were going to have a global search for ideas for this site. A competition was therefore arranged with the world's best architects, designers, an open competition, anonymous. I was appointed the chairman of the jury for that. And we had a mix of people uh, representing community groups, representing business, um, uh, representing uh, broader international design initiatives as well. We had some 150 entries and we narrowed them down to 50, then down to 20, and, and ultimately down to five. The value of this was it presented the community and the government five fundamentally different ways that the site could be developed. The site as a container terminal had a long, straight, one kilometre long concrete slab, almost like the third runway at Sydney Airport. And some of the jury members thought that it was very important to change that, so we went back to the more organic flow of Sydney Harbour with bays and headlands. Others in the jury thought we must add to this bit of heritage, and I didn't see it as heritage, but this big concrete slab and treat it as a part of the city and build on top of that. We ended up choosing a winner, but we put some conditions to that winner, which basically said we didn't want the straight line. We wanted some bays, a headland park, a hill that was really more symbolic of Sydney Harbour itself. The preferred ideas and concepts from the competition were evolved into a plan submitted to the New South Wales Government in 2007. The plan divided the site into three distinct areas. I think the idea of segmenting the whole site into three, South Barangaroo, Central Barangaroo and the Northern Headland, was a smart move. So we have a new financial centre in Barangaroo South and there's a wonderful natural space to us north. Following an approved concept plan, the search began for a company to design and develop the commercial precinct at Barangaroo South. A selection process produced two clear contenders, Brookfield Multiplex and Lend Lease. You don't get too many projects this scale, and uh, while it might have the rights to build it, you've still got to secure tenants. There's not many projects that change the skyline. Barangaroo will change the skyline of Sydney, so it is hugely significant. One of the, the criteria was sustainability and we actually challenged the developers to create a, a climate positive outcome for all Barangaroo. There was a final assessment and the winning proposal was uh, contracted and agreed with lend -Lease. I think as an urban regeneration project, it's pretty perfect to be honest. It's got an economic engine room at the south, highly sustainable, globally significant and so on, so it's making a statement for Sydney. But then that is helping to pay for a fabulous public space for the ratepayers of New South Wales. So it's, to me, the best of both worlds. The approved concept plan and subsequent development proposal contained elements that not everyone was happy with. What's happened here is a corporatisation of the public land. The City Council felt a little bit strange because the government was running this, not the Council, and that led to another tension as to, you know, wouldn't it be better if we ran it and not you? There was a controversy around the hotel positioned over the water. The original land lease proposal to government was for a hotel on a pier on the harbour. All the assessors said, look, that's stunning, that's something special, we should do that. It was also important to a lot of people who felt that it was incorrect, it was wrong, 
and that that edge shouldn't be broken by a hotel pushing out into the harbour. I don't believe the original tender should have included part of the harbour and I want to see that hotel move back onto land. Then the negotiations we're trying to have are with Lendlease. The massive Barangaroo project on Sydney's waterfront has been scaled back. After months of criticism and controversy, the company in charge of the project, Lend Lease, has made some big changes. We've managed to maintain the same open space area on the project whilst bringing a hotel off the water and placing it uh, on shore. Major kind of criticisms we've had about the relocation of the hotel is the loss of public space. And so often, that criticism is not founded in knowledge of the reality of what's being delivered. The fact that there was a, a site to be dedicated to a hotel came together with a proposal separately lodged with the government by Crown for a big complex which would include a high roller casino. Our ambition is to build the best six star hotel in the world in my hometown of Sydney. We want to build an iconic building that complements the Harbour Bridge and the Opera House. The design competition which the Crown Group ran with Lend Lease had produced a very elegant building and it has a sculptural form. I don't think Sydney would have ever got that other than that route. It will be a unique building in its form and its uh, contribution to the, to the Sydney skyline. I mean, any, any big project uh, brings its challenges and controversies. I don't think we've got to the same position at Barangaroo uh, as we saw at the Opera House, but as you saw, uh, that initial resistance uh, passed away to something that's magnificent. There were always going to be controversies. That's part of being in a democracy. That's why it takes longer to build these sites than it would be in other parts of the world. But it's also why, in the end, we will have something greater. Despite the controversy, the site was open to the public, giving the people of Sydney an experience never before possible and a chance to realise Barangaroo's potential. Sydney is the best spot to be for the New Year's Eve. And as the fireworks petered out, the public works could begin, but only after one fairly big challenge was addressed. The cruise passenger operation had to be relocated from Barangaroo for the development of the precinct, um, and therefore we had to move it away in time for Lend Lease to commence their construction works in Barangaroo South. It's located at White Bay, a lovely adaptive redevelopment of a historic shed into a delightful new terminal. Finally, the development of Barangaroo South and the Headland Park could begin. The commencement of construction was the end of the beginning. Uh, there'd been a lot of argument over design issues, uh, there'd been a procurement process to get lend lease as a developer, and I imagine that many people would have thought, when will this ever end? Well, it did, and the build is now well underway. The aim for the design of the commercial precinct in Barangaroo South was to deliver a financial hub for the Asia-Pacific region with adequate scale to suit the needs of global corporations. Well, Barangaroo actually provides the campus to expand the key competitive advantage of Sydney, which is its financial services. If financial services grow, the city and the economy of the state grows. One of the uh, future roles of a city like Sydney is to be an international uh, commercial centre and you want to offer uh, international corporations the opportunity to be headquartered here. If you think about other cities, you know, the Canary Wharfs in London that, that have taken a place and, and, and reorientated the place and given it a strong commercial life, well, Sydney's got that opportunity. It's happening here at Barangaroo. The three commercial buildings, they're um, a pill shape, if you like, curved edges, so they, they're very uh, sympathetic to the west and the east uh, directions. There'll be different uh, facade treatments, so they'll give a little bit of variety. On the uh, Hickson Road, 
side, we have some smaller office buildings. So we're talking sort of 10 storey high things. Then we have a collection of retail buildings and also um, on the waterfront side, we then have some low rise residential that will face out onto the water and also face out into the promenade. So to me, it's, it's quite exciting in, in the sense that you actually, the city can actually get down to the edge of the harbour. Central Barangaroo presented another great opportunity for urban planners to enhance the lifestyle of Sydney. The role in Central is to be that public place within these two entities that is more active. I've called it the veranda of Barangaroo. I've called it the place where the city transitions to the recreational zone. It's where people who are in weekend mode along the waterfront will first touch the city. So it's going to have this role to be very comfortable, it's got to be engaging, but I think it'll be relaxing. The most important part was the initial master planning exercise by a Chicago firm called SOM world-class designers and planners. We see Central as a green and shaded harbour park, but we also see Central as an urban theatre where all of the buildings, as well as the open space, contribute to a very active, vibrant place, a very strong destination. They've come up with some very, very exciting concepts for Central Barangaroo, including uh, the so-called Sydney Steps, which would take the levels up to uh, Kent Street. I also think it lends itself to great big public events. The idea of uh, a harbour stage being placed at the bottom and thousands of people gathered in celebration or, or to come together to enjoy Sydney's culture. We don't really have a big breathing space at the moment within Sydney that we can fill up with art and cultural uses on a transient basis, the role that Fed Square plays in plays in Melbourne, for instance, or South Bank in Brisbane. Within Central, there'll be an, an element of discovery. You know, what, what are the finer grain elements that you're going to find when you walk around there? Some people will only visit once in their life, and some people will work and live there every day. So for the people that are there more frequently, how can it be animated and surprising on a weekly basis? For the Headland Park, Returning the industrial site to a representation of its natural origin required a different kind of thinking. Headland Park seeks to go back to a representation of the headland feel of Sydney when first settlement occurred. The initial design concepts took the existing maps from that era and um, overlay those onto the current geometry of Barangaroo and that was used to form the, the foreshore outline. Headland Park, of course, is naturalistic. And in order to make something naturalistic, there are certain things you really have to do. The headland's periphery, its water edge, should be the natural material of Sydney, Sydney sandstone. Where could we get enough stone? You know? And we looked at the official quarries and what was around and scrap, and came to the conclusion that because the headland had been there through the, through the millions of years, it must have had the hardest stone. So therefore, the hard stone was really under our feet. We were able to quarry all of that sandstone from site and shape it into um, large blocks, which we then placed into the foreshore, which have created the naturalistic looking sandstone foreshore that you see skirting around the bottom of the park. So this is kind of remarkable in itself. The whole of the headland produces itself off the site. What we've tried to do with the plant materials is to use native plants. And they're entirely native plants. And they're not only native to Australia, but they're native to Sydney. So that we've tried as close as we can to recreate a headland that was there before. It's gonna have a large cove in it. We're excavating over 90,000 cubic meters of material to create that cove. I think it's completely different to anywhere else in Sydney. Almost like a playground for the city. I think it's really important that we leave gaps for the future where, where things can be reinterpreted and we can see new ideas being played with. Within Hidland Park there's this most beautiful void with a very, very large sandstone wall running along one edge. It's, it's just the most remarkable, beautiful space. The building is really the centre of the park. It's quite a unique building because what we do is construct the building first and then we actually bring the park over the top. 
So by the time the job's finished, you won't actually be able to see the building. It'll be absolutely stunning, a beautiful place for Sydney fighters to enjoy. During excavation, extensive work was done to ensure the history of the site was preserved and remembered. What we've got the opportunity to do here, because of this development, is where the coves have been cut out, we get in first and have a look at what's there. And what we're finding here are the, the timber piers and, of course, this massive stone seawall that Cuthbert built in 1861. Cuthbert was a big entrepreneurial sort of shipbuilder. He had, ran a very big operation, 350 men at one point. And then we've got the earlier developed from the earlier shipyard by James Munn, which occurred in the 1820s and 30s. What we love about this whole area is the history. It's nice to see, particularly with the stone wall, they're trying to keep some of that. It's like going back 200 years. It is, it's a good feeling to actually see that. While Sydney's past was being uncovered, its future environmental sustainability formed an essential part of the development. Sustainability has always been a cornerstone of what we've tried to do here, and um, certainly, you know, we were very early to be included in the Clinton Initiative for Sustainability. We're part of a global club, if you like, of developments that are seeking to minimise their impact on the environment. So we make the buildings really efficient to start with. Then we service them with really efficient infrastructure, and then we produce our own energy on the site wherever we can. So we've got one of Australia's largest urban solar arrays going into the buildings. In operation, Barangaroo should be climate neutral, um, water positive, and has zero greenhouse gas emissions from waste generation. Um, those, as development goals, are as pretty much as good as you can get and, and are world leading for a project of this scale. Barangaroo has put in a central chill water plant to air condition the buildings and it's much more efficient than air cooling. It uses the harbour and the latent um, coolness of the harbour to pre-chill the water and reject heat into so it's more water efficient and more energy efficient. We've been able to reuse pretty much 99% of material that we've either excavated or concrete that we've broken down or steel that we've recovered back into the project and reuse it. We've worked really hard to make sure that what we've done here is economically, socially and environmentally replicable and beneficial and provide a model for future developments globally. With the Headland Park starting to take its final form, and the commercial towers rising out of Barangaroo South, it was time for the people of Sydney to see for themselves. Seeing that more than 50% of it's actually going to be public space and parkland, it's, it's just going to be awesome. And to take it back to how it was naturally, mm. that's something they don't do anywhere these days. The effort they're putting into putting huge mature trees back, paths for walking and cycling, it's just going to be tremendous. The ability to go down to the harbour rather than just be standing above the harbour and be able to walk down and touch, it's really exciting. It'll be very nice and be lovely for us to come down at night, I think. This is terrific and people will be able to enjoy it for generations to come. People will come to Sydney and they will say, I've seen the Opera House, I've seen the Harbour Bridge and I've been to Barangaroo. Sydney Harbour is defined by these sort of projecting wooded headlands. When you come down the harbour in a ferry or a boat of some kind, what strikes you is that. And now if you go into the Harbour Bridge, you'll see it again. I hope that the legacy of Barangaroo is one of inclusion and one of ambition uh, and integrity. I hope Barangaroo can uh, be a place where everybody can feel that they can be part of, uh, of something special to enrich our cultural and social fabric. I hope that what this will do is to really highlight who um, Barangaroo was and the significance that she played at that time in Australian history. We want international or, or domestic visitors to come and check out Barangaroo and want to come back again and again because it's a great place. There has been some challenges as we've gone on Barangaroo, but again, as time goes by, I think the people look back and think it's magnificent. When people enjoy Hyde Park and they enjoy the Botanic Gardens and think, the founders gave us this, well, I hope they have the same thing to say about 
Barangaroo, except the founders didn't give it to them. It got given to them in the last first gasp of the 21st century. <laughs>